thanks everybody for being here with us today. Uh, we're thrilled to be uh, doing this uh, great panel here at DEF CON uh, with the ICS Village. Thanks to Bryson Bort for inviting us to do this. My name is Jamil Jaffer. I'm the founder and executive director of the National Security Institute at George Mason University's Anton Scalia Law School. We're thrilled again to be here to talking, talking today about uh, the topic, your infrastructure is encrypted, protecting critical infrastructure for ransomware. We have a terrific panel of folks with us today, uh, sort of going around the horn uh, from my left to right. Uh, we've got Jen Detrani, the general counsel at NISOS, a managed intelligence company, helping enterprises identify adversaries and related threats. Uh, Jen has been, uh, has volunteered uh, for every year at DEF CON for a number of years. Uh, she's been a federal prosecutor. She's run a solo law practice and worked at a top law firm practicing commercial law. When she's been at DEF CON, she's been teaching kids how to be white hat hackers uh, through a nonprofit. Um, and she's been a member of the executive leadership team at Sun Law, a nonprofit organization uh, dedicated to helping advance female in-house counsel. Um, and she's a graduate of Dartmouth College of Michigan Law School. And she's grown up in the DC area, uh, but she calls Southern California her home now. So Jen, thanks for being here with us. We also have uh, uh, Ernie Bio. Ernie is an investor uh, with Forge Point Capital. He is uh, previously served as the chief operating officer for the Defense Innovation Unit at DOD, a government startup in the Silicon Valley. Um, he's a board member of Huntress Labs and, and a board, of, uh, board observer at Bishop Fox, now secure in Bayshore Networks. He has an MBA from NYU Stern School and a BS in cellular and molecular biology from Loyola University. So we're thrilled to have you here, Ernie. He's an avid surfer and guitarist and a music enthusiast too, so uh, keep an eye out for that. And last but certainly not least, we have David Etu, good friend of mine. Uh, he's the chief executive officer at NISO. He's got 20 years of experience at early stage of mature companies. He previously served as the global head of managed security services at Blue Voyant and the VP of managed services at Rapid7. He was the VP of BD at Jamalto um, and is now, is now part of, was also part of, led the cybersecurity press at PRTM, which is now part of PWC. He's had a number of other awesome positions. He's also a certified information privacy professional, a certified CISO, and a graduate of GE's Information Management Leadership Program. So Dave, great to have you here with us also. So folks, we've got a great panel and uh, off we go to the races. So I'll start with you, Jen. So, you know, we've heard a lot about ransomware in the last few weeks and months. We've seen uh, the attack on the Colonial Pipeline. Uh, we've seen the attack on Kaseya. We've seen a variety of things, JBS, the Meatpacker. Um, and we've seen the Biden administration do a number of big things, in, including two now executive orders in a row. Talk to us about what those executive orders do. You know, you're a lawyer or maybe a recovering lawyer at some point. Um, talk to us about what, what those executive orders are going to be are going to be effective at, at helping protect the nation from ransomware. And if they're not, uh, what what are they doing that's helpful, and what more needs to be done? Yeah, great question, and and thanks for having me, and and also thanks to ICS for having us. This is a great panel. Um, so yeah, I think what's interesting is that we're seeing a lot of leaning into the situation um, from, from that level, and that is very, very different than what we've seen in the past. Um, I know in the past, we've looked at things in a task force manner. Here, we're seeing DHS actually kind of pushing through in a ma manner of sprints. And these sprints are really meant to address issues that are topical. Um, they're not going to kind of get to the bottom of every issue, but they're forcing the industry to look at things kind of in a cadence. Um, recently, we've seen the ransomware sprint that came out. Um, that was April and May. But right now, I think we're in the industrial control systems sprint. And that is a very critical one, because as we saw with the Colonial Pipeline, um, it is very important that we protect the country against like any sort of um, infrastructure being shut down. And that's where I think, you know, this panel has uh, some great topics ahead of it because we're looking at how it's the it's a public private collaboration, I think that is very novel in this approach. Yeah. Um, as somebody who's kind of practiced in both areas, I think it's really heartening to see that that sense of collaboration. It's always been there, right? I, I, I with law enforcement, you know, there's kind of the sense of kind of poking around to see who's friendly. Now, I think what these executive orders are doing is basically saying, start talking, right? And so yeah. with this sense that zero trust is going to be the overarching like theme of private and public sector, um, and with some definitive controls around trying to require two factor or multi factor authentication, um, trying to segment out networks, there right. is a that we're both both private and public sector are meant to get better with this approach, and it's kind of fun to watch. Yeah. So, David, you know, you've you've been doing some of this stuff operationally, right? Uh, back in the past, in your time at uh, at uh, Rapid Seven, 
um, and Blue Voyant. Talk to us about some of these, uh, some of the sort of the, the operational things we should be thinking about in the context of what's happened with Colonial Pipeline, what happened with JBS, what happened with Kaseya, right? And then these executive orders and sort of, you know, uh, Jen's obviously told us about, about the fact that we're looking, the, at least the government's gonna move to zero trust. I think the, the planet is talking about moving to zero trust, right? Is that the answer? Is that the, is that the solution, right? Is it one of the pieces of it? Is, are, are we heading the right direction? And, and, and if so, great, and, and how can we do more? If not, what would you be doing uh, from an operational perspective if, if, if you were running the show today? Well, first, I think you know one of the challenges we have to step back and, and realize is that you know we we've accrued you know twenty plus years of technical debt in time on the internet, uh, and you know I haven't seen anything from the private sector or public sector that's going to uh, pay down that debt overnight. And so I think you know right. the first acknowledgement is that we're we're working from a deprecated position, and um, and you know, I think what's been challenging at ransomware is I think we've we've always thought about. Uh, you know, critical infrastructure as, you know, from, from state sponsored actors of, you know, what happened if there were, you know, a, uh, a combination of cyber and kinetic action where, uh, you know, the, a, a state actor wanted to disrupt our, uh, either you know, as part of a, an overall kinetic war or for economic reasons, disrupt our infrastructure. We didn't really think about the, uh, the financially motivated actors and, and the components that come with that. So I think, you know, the, the, the difference between the state actors and the financially mo motivated actors is, the financial motive vectors, a lot of the basic blocking and tackling stuff, do, you know, does start to make a difference. That does raise the bar. So, you right. know, segmentation, two-factor authentication, um, you know, I, I – uh, I, I do think you know there there is some degree of hygiene that we either have to figure out how to uh, how to motivate and whether that's motivation through you know uh, I think we too often fall to the regulatory stick of like well someone right. should get a rule that you must do these things uh, perhaps there's other ways to uh, to to drive um, the carrot uh, to motivate folks or or you know one of the things we'll hopefully we'll chat about later is. I'm kind of I'm bullish that the insurance industry can have a role in helping us fix things here because if you hmm. if you don't hit a base level of capability you know if if, if your if your stairs you're building aren't safe you can't get insurance and there's right. some point where where that comes through. so I do think you know, on the operational side we have some some basic block and tack we need to get done and whether that's you know uh, not you know not exposing you know not running five year old you know versions of Microsoft Exchange that have been out hmm. of maintenance for five years uh, or um, right. you know two factor authentication you know network segmentation some basic data security yeah. I think those will go a long way but I think we have to acknowledge that um, there's you know this tech debt is is built up that uh, we're we're not going to pay down overnight and, sure. and how do we motivate folks to do that and you know get either you know, get the right solutions in place or you know spend a lot of time running uh, security operation centers yeah. serving small medium-sized clients at least get them to a point where they can detect and respond uh, in in a faster period and that's again yeah. given what's out there that's not a uh, simple solution overnight but uh like to like you know like to I think we've got some good things making progress on some of the recommendations yeah. So Ernie, you know, it's crazy. Uh, both Jen and David had talked about two-factor or multi-factor authentication as being sort of one of the things that, that's being pushed now. It's kind of crazy that, you know, we're here we are in 2021 and we're still talking about multi-factor authentication. It strikes me as, as nutty, but you have a unique perspective, right? At ForgePoint Capital and, and full disclosure, ForgePoint Capital is an investor in a, in a company that I work for, IronNet Cybersecurity. Um, but uh, but at ForgePoint Capital, you, you help run one of the largest uh, or the largest cybersecurity specific fund uh, in the in the world. Uh, talk to us about you. So you're looking across all these sort of all these potential investments. Talk to us about what the right plays are right now. Like what is the what are the game changing plays that you all see um, in cybersecurity? What are the what are the sort of the um, the the hot ideas out there? Zero Trust is one that's obviously that we've already talked about briefly um, that we mentioned. Tell us if there's some some ideas that you're looking at, y'all looking at in that space. Um, you know, obviously, IronNet does collective defense, right? That's an interesting idea. What's what's what are the hot ideas in your mind out out in the out as you look across the spectrum when it comes to grappling with this sort of ransomware? And a related question, given your experience at DIU um, and bringing that to bear at ForgePoint, is there is ransomware sort of a unique thing that we need to be focused on specifically, or is it just a component of this larger trend of malware coming from both nation state and non nation state actors? Yeah, no, great, great question. Um, to answer your second question, it's it's uh, it's it's just a continual evolution of of malware. And uh, yeah. from an investing standpoint, we we kind of look at it from you know think of it as continuous attack surface uh, testing as well as extended XDR extended defensive response. And we look at it from an investment standpoint, 
network. So how do we restrict lateral movement? So you, you mentioned RNF, but there's there's the network piece, there's the email protection piece, mm -hmm. there's DOP, hopefully next gen DOP is what we're looking at, not yeah. the DOP that serves 1% of the market. Uh, threat Intel on the endpoint side, obviously you have the EDR players, right. you have the strat crowd strikes out there. You also have smaller company, you mentioned Huntress earlier, I'm on the board of Huntress. They do MDR for the SMB. The SMB, SMB is, uh, has been a right target for ransomware because yeah. they have MSPs who are their IT service providers. They don't have the sophistication, the cyber talent, nor the budget. So how do we defend them? How do we leverage deception, privileged access management? Right. Uh, app, and then moving left, app security testing. So everything from traditional SaaS to SCA to DAST, uh, fuzzing, you name it. Uh, and then the other piece is identity. We've made a lot of investments in identity. Um, and as I'm sure David and Jen can attest to, it's identity, they, there's a lot of debt there. There's a lot yeah. of legacy. So how do we you know, start thinking about uh, monitoring entitlements? How do we manage identities cross multi-cloud? Uh, mm. How do we potentially use passwordless authentication, uh, identity proofing, and then obviously right. MFA should be table stakes. So that's kind right. of how we're looking. There, there's no silver bullet. It's this composite solution, which will hopefully get your cyber hygiene up. Yeah, yeah. So so, so Jen, uh, one of the issues that's come up in this conversation is this is just cyber hygiene, right? And the need to sort of get better at the basics, right? We've all talked about that for a long time, the need to just sort of get that bottom level protection up so that, so that you are making the attackers work that much harder, right? And one of the ideas that, that, that David put on the table was this idea of insurance, right? That somehow insurance might be able to help us raise the bar on cybersecurity, right? A lot of people, you know, in Washington, D.C., uh, where, where I think at least a couple, a couple of us live, David, I know lives down the street from me um, in the Washington, D.C. metro area. Um, you know, in, in D.C., a lot of the talk is, you know, regulate, right? Or as David put it, you know, put on the table, you know, that we, we need some sort of government intervention, right? Or maybe, you know, if we just pass enough laws or we get the FTC or the FCC involved, uh, it'll solve everything, right? But this idea of insurance, I think, is interesting to me. Do you do you have a sense of how insurance might, might sort of come to bear on this problem? Um, and and in particular, can insurance help? Can insurance help us get better at the cyber hygiene piece? And can it do more than that? Yeah, I think so. I think so. I mean, David and I don't have any skin in the game, but this is something yeah. we've observed over time. But I mean, just like just like getting good drivers out on the roads, right? Like, there's a concept that you've got to have a vehicle that meets a certain standard. And a driver that set a certain competency like that that is who you will ensure to drive same same with the insurance industry as it relates to companies right like they've that you've got people sitting on data that doesn't belong to them and so how are they going to be the responsible stewards of that data right how are they going to ensure that at these smbs who have a hard time you know scaling up have the appropriate security measures in place i think it's all about standardization and compliance mm. those insurance companies can push requirements down on companies to get them compliant in a way that the government won't be able to, right? right. It's a matter of doing business. And so I, I think, you know, we've seen some insurance companies who are kind of pushing towards that, but that standardization, I think will come from that, from that lateral movement into industries because yeah. they need insurance. No company is gonna operate, you know, without that. And so right. to get that, you're gonna have to level up. And I think that leveling up is is what a lot of us are here to talk about today, which is yeah. it's more than just you know those those few things. It's so many things we can't even describe them all. But uh, I mean, even even like the cloud migration. I mean, I mean, we talk about you know at at Nisos, we talk about the fact that like if the CIA can get you know everything up in the cloud, right? And they're, they're and they're classified <laughs> stuff, right? Yeah. Pretty amazing. Yeah. yeah, they had a hard time. So like so so. I think it's just a matter of, of shifting the mindset around some yeah. of that stuff. And a lot of that is going to be kind of pushed down again. Maybe it's maybe it's partially legislation, maybe it's partially from you know the folks who help businesses run like insurance companies, yeah. but I think it's a I think it's a team sport. Yeah. So Ernie, from an investing perspective, yeah, sorry, David, do you have something to weigh in no, on? I'm that? sorry, go ahead, go ahead. That was me. Yeah. Oh yeah, no, so Ernie. So from a you know from a from an investing perspective, how do you see sort of one the insurance marketplace um, and that and that driving cybersecurity? How do you see actually the venture investing space? Or one of the things I've always wondered about is how come venture investors aren't saying to their companies, "Hey, look, you need to protect your own assets." Literally, all we're investing in is your IP. If that's not well defended, you know, we're, we're SOL, right? Help me understand sort of 
you know, what's the right play here? Is, is, are there plays in the insurance space? Are there plays in the, in the investing space? And, and, and if yes or no to those, do we need legislation? Do we need regulation? Like what, for, you know, sit down there in Silicon Valley. I know the general view is, you know, government can stay out there. That's great. And I think that's generally been how it's, how it's happened. But there is a push now for the government to get more involved in what's happening in the Valley. How do you see that? And then what's your sense of it? Yeah, you know, we're seeing um, a lot of cybersecurity MGAs, so ma ma managing general ag agents. Uh, okay. You have the coalitions out there, at bay, resilience insurance, and th their models are all a little different. Some are approaching the S and the SMB, some are doing upper mid market. Mm -hmm. uh, but what they're all doing in different different levels is doing security scans before they write a policy and okay. during the course of the policy. Some are looking at, hey, how do we do DIFR on the back end? How do yeah. we keep the hygiene up? Because at the end of the day, in the cyber business, it's about your loss ratio. So if they can keep the loss ratio down, it's more advantageous to them. And then it, be, it becomes this kind of, um, you know, OODA loop, if you will, with the customers. Yeah. Um, yeah. They're, right, they're writing more premiums. The loss ratio is less. Cyber hygiene is going up, especially in the SMB. Yeah. Uh, and you know everyone's everyone's happy uh, theoretically. Hmm. Um, so I, I think that's a great first step. It's very early days in yeah. that industry, but there's a lot. I mean, look at the amount of funding that's going in. Uh, I think Ape just just announced 185 million round yesterday or today. So yeah. it, it's uh, as far as the government coming in. I think the government should get their their own house in order first, right? Uh, you know, quite frankly, and you know, follow the, the executive order. Obviously, with Jen Easterly at CISA, right, uh, and Newberger in the, in the White House, like there's yeah. some really A players, yeah. uh, and um, at the end of the day, it's shared responsibility. So yeah. let's get our own houses in order and then share information, uh, which uh, you know, I'm sure you you've lived that um, that that hardship, right? Because the government yeah. never wants to share. They, they'll take any information you give. It's hard for them to share. So, right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, so, I, would say, I, would say, I mean, I'm a huge fan of you know the coalition and resilience and those models that you know the the cyber insurers being more um, uh, both more data driven and more uh, you know and and providing frankly you know in some ways light managed services on their clients' behalf. I think right. it really really raises the bar. And 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 you know I think it's it's not just in the fact that. Of the insured, uh, I think you know what what I, what I'm hopeful for is that they have the ability to bring people who are not currently insurable into the market, uh, which is a you know a huge change in our, you know, our in our base cyber hygiene. And so that that uh, that you know finding ways to help people get insurable is a uh, is a big deal. Well, you know, David, on that point, you know, one of the things that, that governments have done when, it, when we're talking about you know car insurance and the like is they sort of require insurance companies to take on some amount of managed risk, right? Some amount of sort of, you know, the 18 year old me driving around, um, you know, nobody, nobody wants to insure that guy. Right. And so, so, uh, you know, there, there is, there are some, some earlier models for that, but I have, a, I have a sort of related question for you. You know, one of the things that Ernie mentioned, uh, was this idea of, of, you know, of companies coming in and trying to figure out, you know, what the problems are before they go in, right. Whether it's with an investment, we've heard a lot about this in the M and A space, right. With insurers, right. Sort of assessing companies from the outside, Sometimes from the inside, right? We've, there are a lot of companies that have created businesses out of doing that type of assessment. I've always wondered how sort of capable those assessments are, right? Is it really realistic to be able to tell how vulnerable a company might be from the scans you do from the outside and the scans you do from the inside, right? And, and you've been at service providers that have come in both before and after the fact to try and figure out, you know, what these what what it looks like. Do you have a sense of whether, particularly from a critical infrastructure perspective, and from a vulnerability to ransomware, or frankly any type of malware? It's you know in a lot of ways ransomware is simply an example of that, right? Can you can you really tell that from the outside yeah. in or from the inside out? And if so, yeah. is it a good measure for insurance and M and A and you know diligence for investors? Yeah, I mean, so so uh, first to say yes, and in full disclosure, that's a business that Vsos is is in today. But I, 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 I didn't tell, know that by the way. So yeah, I, I did yeah, not know but, that. So. But, but but I tell you why why it works. That's what the adversaries do. Uh, you know that that uh, if you know, that you can you can have you can take the perspective of the defender and and uh, and dig in. Um, yeah. But uh, they're you know that's what the adversaries do, and it's working for them. So, so in the it, sense it that works. You said that they're testing they're testing from the outside to see who's vulnerable. 
And yeah. as a result, sort of that's what, if we do that, we can get a sense for it too. Is that your point? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're you know, they're, they're using Shodan. They're using, you know, that the, 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 the yeah. they understand what's vulnerable. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, the, the, the thing from a service perspective side, I think the thing that where people get, uh, get run into big challenges and particularly when you talk about insurance or, um, you know, or supply chain things is that some of the, you know, it, it, it's very hard to identify the, um, you know, the, the true external footprint of an organization. And so we yeah, have actually one of, one of Ernie's uh, mm. companies, Bishop Fox actually has a, has a, has a great offering or two is I think what, what everyone has the story of a, of a supply chain scorecard that, you know, had some, got some terrible score because it included their de- guest network or a franchise or those things. And so, yeah. you know, the, the chat, you know, I think the challenge to it is doing it well. Uh, yeah. But, um, but I think again, our, our adversaries are doing it well. It's like, Hey, I, I'm looking for, you know, I mean, what's with their, they're going, Hey, I'm looking for things that have this, you know, this known vulnerability that, that exists in this space for an organization that I think has the capability of paying this ransom. Uh, that right. is it, that is in a country that either doesn't have judicial reach to me or, um, uh, you know, or, uh, or, you know, law enforcement action that, uh, right. that would, would prevent this. And so they're clearly doing it. Uh, and I think, you know, we, we have to leverage that same, you know, intelligence capabilities, yeah. Uh, uh, ourselves, but I think the important thing is doing it responsibly. You know, doing it yeah. and giving you know, giving someone a you know a, a bad grade publicly is not. Uh, I don't think it's going to help us where we where we need to be. Right. Fair enough. Fair enough. So so no name and shame unless it's unless it's the Chinese <laughs> or the Russians, not for yeah. our companies. Um, yeah. yeah. And you know, look, there's there's a point where you know you, there's, you you need to be a certain height to ride the internet. But over right. there, we got we got to realize that. No one's ever going to be perfect in this, and, and right. that we uh, we got to figure out how we again how we motivate, not uh, not just uh, penalize. Fair enough. So, Jim, one of the things that, that David just talked about was this idea of sort of supply chain vulnerability, right? And we've seen this has become a really hot topic. I mean, it's been a hot topic for a long time, but it's gotten really hot in light of this ransomware attacks, in part because you know people think about you know what happened with Solar Storm and the fact that was a supply chain vector, and now with Kaseya, that's a supply chain vector, right? People also concerned of the downstream effects of, a, of, a, of an attack on a thing like the Colonial Pipeline, right? And that has sort of spillover effects. That's not quite a supply chain, that's not a supply chain attack, but it shows the sort of spillover effects. And then of course the COVID-19 pandemic and what we've seen the vulnerabilities in America's supply chain are dependencies on, on certain foreign countries, including adversaries like China. So Jen, help me understand, you know, from a, from a you know, sort of what the government can do perspective, right? Um, and what, or, or at least what, what you know, legislation might do to help address these supply chain threats. One of the things that's talked about in the executive order, right, um, with respect to federal cybersecurity is sharing of information between private sector actors, contractors who work for the government, right, requiring them to share information about incidents and potential incidents. We've now heard legislation up on the Hill moving uh, where there's uh, an effort to get people to disclose, it goes beyond data breaches, but disclose any incident you might have. Tell, tell us how to think about that. And will, will, will disclosure to incidents sort of be enough to sort of address any supply chain threats or is it a bigger problem that we've got to, we've got to go further on and, and and is even instant disclosure a worthwhile thing to even get in the business of talking about? I, mean, I, I think just it's, it's it's really I think it'll we'll find out when it plays out um, but yeah. I think it's hard to say I think I think it's disclosure I think is a is a step in the right direction right it's that same okay. sense of wanting to understand so you can measure right you can you right. can understand if you can't if you can't evaluate it then how can you respond to it appropriately mm-hmm. right and so we're, we need to create metrics across a very more than just our own organizations to understand what's going on and i think there's a sense whether it's ransomware whether it's a supply chain issue that when companies experience an event right they they really don't want it to be a breach they want it to stay an event and not yeah. even that kind of scary we deploy all our resources to try to understand what to do on our company's own best interests. If if there's a directive to to share that outside of that, which I think a lot of companies, a lot of lawyers who are comfortable and have points of contact within federal agencies, like are are, are already comfortable reaching out to try to pick Interesting. whether it makes sense to disclose something. But yeah. this directive that says you you need to, you should, we want you to, and 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 there, there's no sense of impending penalties, right? Yeah. Like penalties come when you do something poorly. The penalties don't come when you show that you were vulnerable. Everybody, every company is vulnerable. There's no sense yeah. of like, um, you know, 
we talk about zero trust, there's no 100% security. Like yeah. that would be an amazing state to exist within, but no company exists within that state. So right. I think that that directive that says share, let us know is is around that that attempt to try to create metrics that allow for a valid response that can be coordinated yeah. across more than just one company. And I yeah. think that's very laudable. I think that is a step yeah. for sure, a step in the right direction. Whether it's going to be effective and how quickly, that's very hard to say. Yeah, and yeah. no, that's a great it's a great point about sort of the the need for information to get out there in the marketplace in order to, for us to coordinate responses. So Ernie, you know, go into this question of responses, right? You served in the government, you served in the Department of Defense, you were in the military, um, you served at DIU, and now you've come out and you're in the investment space in cybersecurity. But, you know, one of the things that's been talked a lot about is that the government not only needs to get its own house in order on the defensive side, but it needs to do more potentially offensively, right? The government needs to respond more effectively uh, to these types of attacks. You've seen uh, now the Biden administration talk about the fact that, you know, we're gonna name the countries involved. We're gonna start talking about uh, holding countries like Russia, like China responsible for some of the things that happen in their space, even if they're not nation state uh, actors, but if they're criminal gangs operating their space and they know about it, we might hold them accountable. What what? Is this the right road to go down? Do we want to be whole one? Do we want to treat ransomware as the FBI director said, like terrorism, which I think was code for if you harbor these guys, we'll start treating you like you're responsible, right? Is that is that the right approach? Um, and then second, do we need to get more offensive? I mean, you know, do we need to be punching back more often? I like to use the analogy of sort of the bully on the playground, right? Where, you know, we all tell our kids, you know, yeah, go tell the teacher and the teacher will tell the principal and then we'll have a meeting and we'll solve the problem, right? But we also all really know that if in fact you want your kids to stop building a playground, best thing to do is put them in a self-defense class, have them punch the bully in front of everybody, and the bully's gonna stop bothering them and nobody else is gonna bother them too. Now nobody's saying tell your kids that, right? But it works. And so, you know, should the government be punching back harder in cyberspace? I mean, so this, this, is, this is a, a great question. And um, I think that on the classifying them as terrorists, you know, I, I look at it with, with, with cyber, there, there's a Bino line. There's yeah. there's criminal activity and nation state activity that looks to, that's directed at, you know, data rich companies, it, whether mm -hmm. it's pure ransomware, extortionware. Right. Uh, and then what we've seen recently with, with JBS, with Colonial Pipeline, now we have essential services that are being attacked. And mm -hmm. it's one thing to you know, blow up uh, a nuclear facility or something that extreme. It's another thing yeah. when you shut down the supply chain of oil and gas on the East Coast. And I think back, it, this might be a, a, a interesting analogy, but I was living in New Jersey when Hurricane Sandy hit. Yep. Lost power for almost two weeks, run up in gas prices, people fighting at Home Depot for generate. It caused chaos. And yeah. if you think of a cyber attack, it's, it, it, it it can have those physical effects in, or those effects in the physical world. So yeah. to me, they, there's a clear distinction there. And are they, you know, if you're harboring these these cyber criminals, uh, I think you should be held accountable uh, for, for letting them um, operate with impunity. On the offensive side, yes, we should be more offensive. You know, General yeah. Nakasone at the NSA, ever since he took over, the whole he had the whole concept of defend forward right and to me that's you know start punching a little more and going yeah. into other people's neighborhoods and showing them hey what's what's going on here so i yeah. i i agree with that mentality now what i don't know being out of the government now is what happens behind the scenes all the clandestine right. stuff but right. overt um overtly we should be punching back harder yeah so so dave dave you know you've seen some of this stuff you you when you worked at blue voyant you all defended some of the largest financial sector players in the business um talk to us about how how bad is the threat when it comes to critical infrastructure right you you know the, you you've seen a lot of you saw a lot of it rapid seven too so talk to us about um um how bad the threat looks and and it is is what ernie says right if, if the government starts punching back more so we get more aggressive on, on General Oxone's effort on defend forward persistent engagement, right? You know, we've got, as Ernie pointed out, we've got all these amazing people in cyber now. We've got Chris Inglis as National Cyber Director, Jen Easterly at DHS. We've got Ann Newberg at the White House. I mean, Rob Joyce is back at NSA on the on the defensive side. I mean, it is it is like a who's who of, of, of cyber cyber defenders and people, frankly, who are willing to go a little sort of a little more up against the enemy and 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 punch them, right? So so 
from your perspective, having seen what the threat is of critical infrastructure, is this the right approach? Or, or you know, there have been a lot of people who said we shouldn't punch back because we live in a glass house, right? And if right. we punch too hard, they're going to hit us really hard, and we're more vulnerable and more likely to more likely to have problems than they are. Is that is that right? I mean, how do you how do you think about this? Now, I I, I uh, I'm not sure I'd, I'd say glass house I'd say, but I, I think we you know while we are likely the most capable uh, from an offense perspective, we also likely have the most to lose defensively. Uh, and okay. I think that has to factor into our, you know, the policy of how we think about this. But see, you know, if you talk about critical infrastructure, I mean, it, it's a fascinating term. So we're, we're sitting here talking, you know, in the ICS village, which is, you know, very focused on the industrial control side. I mean, DHS categorizes 16 categories of critical infrastructure. I mean, you know, in some ways, everything is critical infrastructure in a lot of ways. And, yeah. and, I, and I exaggerate a little bit for the point, but I think the challenge of it is, is we, we often think, and particularly I think on the policy side, get, get wrapped up in the haves versus the have nots is, you know, a, yeah. uh, you know, a, an investor owned utility or, you know, a, a money center bank, um, you know, has amazing capabilities, uh, you know, but the, you know, by nature of, of these industries we're talking about, they're all highly interconnected, you know, financial services, right. but, you know, is, is, is obviously, you know, highly interconnected, but, but I think folks, you know, on the, uh, like the energy industry, on when, when you, you, you know, you've lived in well is uh, there's, um, you know, our, we, we have a, a handful of grids uh, and when yeah. one of them has an impact and there's there are from major investor owns you know multi-billion dollar organizations uh to very small rural co-ops and i think what we what we often forget are the the state of the have-nots uh right. and and uh, i think you know then i think you know wendy nather's great piece years ago of living you know below the security poverty line and so you know there's there's organizations that you know have have 10 people on it uh on right. our power grid uh or less or, i mean yeah, you know. yeah, yeah. 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 And so I think that um, when we talk about things like, you know, information sharing and, uh, you know, and public private partnership, like those things are great, you know, when you can, when you, you can take the, you know, the, the intelligence team from Exelon or from JPMC uh, and, you know, have them talk to their peers, you know, when it's the, uh, when it's a, you know, a, you know, a, a small rural electrical co-op it's a very right. different conversation and right. you know as, as we've seen from uh, I'm, I'm blanking on the details of the attack but as we saw you know in in one of the the, the you know uh, russian uh, attributed attacks on our you know, program, came, came in through a uh, a maintenance supplier in a, in a small rural co-op so i think right. that that that's that smb conversation is one that's just so critical uh to to our overall you know, a critical infrastructure security that we, yeah. we we just that that leaves us vulnerable in the uh, in the punch back side again. It's like yeah. I, I, there's there's definitely places for for punching back, and I'm I'm all for it. I think we've you know I I love that we've been uh, more aggressive and recovered money and uh, and things over right. the past. So I think there's 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 a lot of roles for that, and, and I think a lot of really um, impressive and creative collaboration in finding ways to legally you know uh, take down infrastructure or take over infrastructure. Uh, so I think there's a lot more we could be doing, but I think uh, we just have to. Yeah. Keep poly keep keep our you know our our state in mind as we do that. Yeah. Well, so on, on that on that front, Jen, you know, one of the things that that uh, that we've seen the government do a lot of right is is indict cyber criminals. You're a former federal prosecutor, uh, right? Uh, or a former prosecutor, you um, have seen some of these cases go down. Uh, you know, is is it really sensible to to for indict folks? We know we're never going to get right. We had these Chinese you know, military officers, we have these Russians, uh, these Russian cyber criminals, some of whom are associated with the government, right? There's no chances that we're gonna get these folks here. And so in a lot of ways, it feels like just a name and shame game when it comes to these indictments, right? Is there any value to these indictments? And, and if there is or there isn't, right? Um, what about getting more aggressive? Are there, are there any legal concerns we might have with doing the kind of things that Ernie's talking about, sort of, uh, you know, getting more aggressive, punching back, right? Or you know, are there are there legal concerns with helping the smaller providers? Can we can we do something uh, as a legal matter to help these smaller providers get the information they need if they don't have small teams? Can we can we push them the information um, or or focus the information on them uh, without you know without having a problem where we're not helping these other folks? Right? Is there is there a problem when we treat people differently given how they're situated? So a number of questions there. Sorry about that. I, that was I think a three parter. <laughs> okay, I'm going to address them all together. Um, awesome. That's a great question. Uh, no, I I think. Uh, I think the word that comes to mind when I think about the prosecutions is like symbolism, right? Like it's it's a yeah. symbolic 
sort of um, shot. Um, it's a long shot, right? It, it, the, the idea that these people will be held accountable, you know, in a court of law in the United States is very far fetched. Yeah. Um, but is it is it meaningless? Probably not, right? Because okay. I think I think there's a sense that even identifying, you know, somebody who is hacking, you know, whether it's SMBs or like, you know, our nation itself is, right. is mutable. Like that person has an identity behind a screen in a place that is very many time zones away. But still, the idea of like literally like throwing down the gauntlet that this is the person who we know it's you. Yes, that's that is. Yeah. I think there is something very um, gratifying about that. I don't think it'll go so far as being gratifying as far as putting them in one of our you know um, jails. Um, right. That would be amazing, but but probably not. But I think okay. you know the the question of what is an appropriate response and how do we properly defend you know our country and our co companies um yeah. is is multi-layered i think a lot of a lot of the time like well, we haven't even touched on like diplomacy right like there's the idea of sanctions the idea of like which which country is is this coming from and will mm -hmm. they be responsive to the diplomacy that kind of accompanies the sense that sanctions have the right repercussions for that right. country and, and then can you lean on that country to then help you find justice against those individuals who were part of it? Now, in a lot of the countries that we're talking about today, those those individual actors are not individual actors per se, right? Like we talk right. about having their own HR departments within the right. criminal organizations, they're very organized, they're probably state sponsored and, and that's just not a realistic outcome. Yeah. I think it's interesting, you know, Last week, you know, there was there there was a bill. There's a bipartisan bill that's being introduced mm. about allowing companies to hack back. And I don't know if you guys have seen that. Yeah, but, you know, that that was a 2017 initiative. It's you know it's been revived. And the question there is like, you know, what would be the right proportionate action by a company? Mm. Like, how would a company say, "All right, you did this. Like, okay, now you get this." Yeah, Assuming that you could rise to that level of sophistication like the question and, and at the GC level, right? Like a lot of us are kind of questioning, like, do we want to be the individual who's saying go for it? Yes. Right, like, right. Like it's all systems go, like give it to them. Like th that is, it, be, it feels very far fetched, but that is a legitimate bill that is coming yeah. through. That is no, that, yeah. that, bears some, that bears some consideration because that's, if that's where we're at, you know, we might as well put everything on the table and think through that because there aren't many other options and remedies for companies yeah. yeah so so ernie look this has come up a number of times right this idea of of, of private sector hack back right it, go, it dates back right as a military matter back to the founding of our nation right where we actually use private private ships to sort of form a navy for us and really defend the defend our coastlines right even though we had a nascent navy right we would often give these letters of market reprisals people as people refer to them you know it's in the constitution right and give these things to private individuals to go fight back on behalf of the nation uh, we obviously have today a cyber command they have offensive capabilities even before cyber command existed we've had we had the joint functional component command for network warfare that did some more of the offensive stuff but there is a lot of discussion about private sector companies being able to respond in some way right some people talk about active defense as meaning you know, look, if, if somebody hits me, I can send sort of the, the way I would like a die pack in a, in, in a, in a package of money, right? It'll go explode in their network, I'll know it was them. It'll beacon back, it'll tell me it was them, right? Never mind that beaconing activity looks a lot like what malware does right at the outset, but okay, whatever, fine. So it'll beacon back to me and maybe even it'll detonate and it'll destroy my data, right? But then what if it goes a little further, right? Ernie, is this a place we should be going where, well, maybe it detonates and takes down their infrastructure, not? Not in not their whole systems, but just the stuff they use to attack me, right? Is that a place we should be going? And should we be worried about if this is, as as Jen points out, potentially, even though it looks like criminal activity, it might be state sponsored activity, right? Is there a threat that we might have private sector companies get us into that so called you know land war in Asia? Do we have to worry about that? That's a tough one. That's a really tough one because part of me says, yeah, you you should be able to defend your organization um and you should be able to respond proportionally or maybe disproportionately the other part of me you know thinks with kinetic warfare there, there's always collateral damage yeah. uh and there, there could be fratricide uh so you I mean, know look at not look at not petcha right i mean not petcha an attack by the russians against ukrainians 
you know, $300 million per company, right? $10 perfect. billion dollars worldwide. Perf perfect example. Perfect example. You know, the I, I, I think as much as I'd like to see something like that, I think it would get too chaotic. Mm. You'd have the collateral damage. You'd have, you know, it, it's not like when we had Stuxnet, there, there was an organization that could use four zero days and do it very accurately, right? That you, you, can, you can't expect, you know, a mid market, even an enterprise, a JP Morgan to do that. Right. So I, I think well, I don't know. Tell I don't know. Jamie Dimon might 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 disagree with you. He's got <laughs> renewed. So he, he well, they, they might they might be the one exception. But you know, when they were when the financial inst institutions were attacked in 2012 by the Iranians, yeah. right? The government didn't help. Uh, my understanding is, uh, and I know people that were involved. Uh, the, the government said no, and and ultimately the um, the you know, call it enemy servers went dark. Uh, and so weird. Is, it, was, it was the Israelis, right? They came in. So anyway, it, it's it's a slippery slope. Uh, I, I think we got to be very careful with that. Yeah. So Jen, what about from a legal perspective? Let's say we did grant these letters of market reprisal to companies that you know that 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 um that are that are being attacked, critical infrastructure companies only, and, and only really capable ones, right? Only the big ones and only the smart ones, right? Whatever. Uh, we pick them. We give us authority. We say you can only do these set of things, right? Do we want private sector businesses doing this sort of thing, right? Is, is Are there any legal concerns with that? And even if there aren't legal concerns, are there policy concerns about allowing private sector companies, even with all the law, all the legal authority in the world from the US government, a little sheet of paper saying, you're acting on our behalf. Do we want them in that business? I mean, at the risk of alienating all of my friends who are general counsels, I would say, I would say probably not. I mean, general counsels are not cyber experts you know by merit of having except for you well i'm i'm still working on it that's why i've got to spend a lot of time around it. um no but, but i think i think it's the I, I think that's the problem right i mean general counsels are the word general is in there for a reason like we are yeah. just at the heart of it if we're not then it, it's very hard to execute against so many different things that affect a company um the question of like whether we want to be empowered to use force under a un charter like Probably not. It's probably the same question as like, should I be carrying a gun, even if I can get a gun from it? Probably not. Uh, that's, I think it is, it's an interesting question. I mean, I, I think there are legal ways through it, right? And there are corporate governance ways through it. You can create yeah. committees that can evaluate things that can get down to like a very narrow issue and protect itself and understand that it's making a decision in the best interest of the entity and then yeah. taking to account all of the other considerations, which would be, you know, the country, the collateral damage, the repercussions, and and do it in a coordinated way with government. Um, yeah. Maybe that, maybe if that, then possibly. But I would still, you know, err on the side of what Ernie said, which is, yeah. it's a big, it's 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 a big leap of faith, right? And it's yeah. a leap of faith that may not even be successful, even if you had the technical chops to execute it. What yeah. are you going to get? Is it that sense of redemption? Right, yeah. akin to that DOJ style, like you know, we've now named right. him. We've done something. Yeah, is it is how right. how it's probably very gratifying, but is it is yeah. it ultimately empty? Effective. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So David, you know, well, it sounds like Ernie and General are like, look, we're not private companies doing this. It's not the greatest idea, right? So let's let's say that's right. Let's say we're we're not going to have private company do, companies do this, and we're really going to take uh, you and Ernie up on on your suggestion that the government gets more aggressive and sort of does its part, right? Does the government know enough about what the private sector is being hit by to effectively respond to it and and sort of deter behavior, right? I mean, it's one thing to say, okay, the government's not willing to do it, right? Which they haven't been for a while. And now hopefully under General Oxoni, they're getting more aggressive and they have more authority, right? So maybe they are willing to deter and maybe even capable of deterring, right? Do they know who to go after? Do they know how to go about it? Do they, do they have the information they need to really sort of deter those who are coming up against our private sector or do they need you know, we've talked about information sharing and that's all great and well, right? You know, more data, fine, great, terrific, right? But a lot of it needs to be about collaborating in real time too, right? Working together consistently day to day, day in, day out, holding hands as these things happen. Are we are we anywhere near that? I, I mean, I think if, if we're if we're talking hit back from a cyber attack, I think that's a very that's a much more complex conversation and and you know information sharing becomes a uh, you know really really challenging uh I, I had a I had a conversation, you know, 
few years ago with uh, with someone at a, at a senior level at a, at a, at a state uh, law enforcement agency. And, you know, that this idea is like talking to the FBI is like, um, you know, being a psychiatrist in the chase lounge is like, they ask all the questions, you do all the talking. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, it's, it's a very, a very one-way conversation. So I, I, right. I do think a, you know, a two-way, um, you know, communication is, uh, you know, is, is critical. Uh, yeah. you know, and, and by the way, just not only for accuracy, but also for things like collateral damage, like, like the, you do mm. this and you're going to take out, you know, you know, the, you know, the East coast, you know, like, you're going to take out a pipeline or you're going to take out a, right. like, you know, so understanding the dependencies is challenging. But what, but what I think we're missing in the, in the hackback conversation and part, part of why I love the naming names, uh, you know, side is hmm. attribution is really important for two things. One is, uh, you know, it, um, yeah, it, it, it can give you organizational insight as to, to who's doing it. So is, is this one person, you know, or a small group of people who are financially motivated? Does it, you know, is it a, is it a broader network um, that's accomplishing right. other goals? How are they being financed? Uh, and, and when we know those things, we can all of a sudden take, uh, take very different actions. It doesn't have to be just stable infrastructure. It can be, you know, stop their ability to move money. Uh, right. You know, it, not to it, cyber. Yeah, it, it, there, there's a lot of other things that uh, that we can do. I mean, I, again, I agree with Jen that the likelihood of these people ever showing up in a U.S. jail is low. But uh, I just kind of grin and go, well, there's a we just took a lot of places that uh, they can't go on vacation and spend that money they're making <laughs> yeah. that, uh, where, where extradition comes into play. So I, I do think there's a much broader set of actions that when we know the the individuals, um, you know, and then the entities that are part of behind it that that the U.S. government, um, you know, uh, you know, ha has actions that can take, and that's a very different coordination problem that you know yeah. that, that coordinating a you know a cyber defense mission, a you know uh, a financial you know crimes mission, a uh, you know money laundering or OFAC like things like that. That's a, a very different degree of coordination that I'd actually love to see you know a, a a difficult sprint around on the government side and sorting that out. Yeah. So, so, so this is really interesting. So, you know, uh, we're coming up on, on the end of our, our time uh, together. Um, and one of the things I want to sort of end on um, is a question about ransomware itself, right? Because the topic of our panel is critical infrastructure and ransomware. One of the things that got really interesting about the colonial pipeline hack, right, was that uh, early on in, in, the, in the attack, uh, colonial pipeline took their systems offline, right? Uh, they did some stuff, and then they came back up fairly quickly. Everyone was concerned about the potential for a major supply chain disruption of oil on the East Coast. Um, there were even some people who were, who were hoarding gas, crazily putting bag uh, gas in plastic bags. By the way, for those of you out there, don't put gas in plastic bags. It doesn't work. It's a bad idea. Please don't do that. Um, but but there were these concerns, right? Legitimate concerns about about uh, about a supply chain disruption, and Colonial Pipeline avoided it. Well, come to find out later on that they had paid the ransom. Right now, yes, the FBI went and they were able to get, get some of that back. That's a whole other question about how the FBI had the private key uh, to the Bitcoin to get that to get that uh, that ransom back. That I'll leave for the audience. But I have a question for, for each of our panels, which is, should we be permitting companies to pay ransoms in order to get them back up and running faster? And if your answer is yes, or at least for critical infrastructure, a qualified yes, doesn't that incentivize the business? And if it does, how do we solve that problem? Aren't we sort of quote unquote negotiating with the terrorists? So I'll start with you, David, and I'll end. I'll end with Jen because she's the lawyer in the room, and I want to get the lawyers out. But David, first to you. So I, I, I would not. Uh, I'm not supportive of the government um, having a no ransom policy uh, today. Is that that folks uh, that that people need to make a, a risk based decision in their business? And I, it, it, it I, I get it. it I loathe uh, the fact that it supports uh, these actors and and continues to um, uh, it helps propagate the problem. But I think that you know, a, any the, the government telling a uh, a private sector um, you know entity what they can or can't do you know with you know financially in a risk situation uh, you know we we, we you know, taking I, I try to all parallels we didn't go back and say you couldn't take you know, you couldn't pay kidnapping ransoms uh, that uh, you know we dealt with that as, uh, as as a as a law enforcement problem and so I, I think we're not quite ready for that I do think there are a number of um, there are some things where some tools that we that that while you say yes you can pay uh, I do think we're under leveraging the um, you know the the OFAC and uh, uh, and you know, money moving process that, you know, there, there's a, there's a small and growing kind of school of thought that paying ransom uh, 
should should require some more knowledge and attribution of the entity to make sure that you're not funding, uh, you know, as a as a as a U.S. entity, you can't fund things that are that are SDNs. Uh, so, I, you know, I think there there are ways that we could um, we can wield other things uh, beyond the individual uh, companies. But can, but, but can I can I ask you about that? So I always hear this, right? Like, okay, we should make sure as long as they're not paying terrorists or or you know whatever. But look, they're paying. Cyber hackers, right? For all we know, these cyber hackers are funding. I mean, what are we supposed to ask them for ID before we pay them? Like, what, I, I, how's how's that going to work? I don't I don't get that. How do yeah, I mean, that? yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, obviously, there, there's 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 ways. Um, there 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 are services out there that help with this. There are, um, okay. and, and I think you know there there's you know perhaps there's ways you can come come to knowledge about the transaction that gets you to a comfort level uh but, but we've you know, we we've had this sdn methodology you know yeah. as a as a country for a long time and it's you know while it's not perfect it's been it's been quite yeah. effective at at uh at taking out you know particular groups of actors and i'd love to see it use okay. more here and, and, and sdns are specially designated nationals right people who are on sort of the terrorist list and the like um yeah. uh, sanctions list um all right ernie over to you um should we allow companies to pay ransoms and if so what about this uh this threat that it'll just incentivize the business more yeah so first i i don't think it should be binary you either pay or you okay. don't uh in a recent study i read only eight percent of organizations got all their data back and 29% okay. got half, which blew my mind because I thought if you paid, you probably have like a 75% chance of getting it back. Uh, so today, I, I agree with David. It's like you're not going to tell, like if your if your kid gets taken hostage, you're not the government's not going to tell you don't pay the ransom. You want your your child back. So right. I think they might, but you're still going to pay the ransom. <laughs> it might, yeah, right. but it, it's it's a risk based decision. It, is yeah. is PII on the line? Uh, or is it an essential service? Is it affecting national infrastructure? Is it affecting, you know, um, something that that could cause actual physical harm, you know, yeah. harm in the physical world? So I, I think it's up to the businesses. I, I don't like it, but yeah. I, I think there's no there's there's no you know binary answer to this. Yeah. Can I just follow up on that though? So okay, so let's say let's, it sounds like you'd be more willing to accept payment of ransoms if if critical infrastructure is involved. Is that did I hear that right? That, that that's yeah. It, it's you have to look at first, second, third, and yeah. order effects. Yeah. Okay. So, so if that's right, though, aren't we just telling the bad guys, hey, you know what you should really go after? You should go after critical infrastructure because that's where we're going to be willing to pay the biggest ransom. So, hey, Clono Pipeline, that was smart. Do more of that. You'll get paid more often. Yeah. I, I, I would not write that down or <laughs> or suggest that. It, it right. would, it, it's kind of, again, it's business risk. With yeah. the business knowing what type of risk uh, that 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 ransomware and extortionware is going to affect right. on their customers and on, on the enough. populace. All right, Jen, you have the first word and you get the last word. Tell us what you think about about ransomware, you know, and and should we be allowing companies to pay ransoms? And what about this incentive effect, right? If we if we tell them, like Ernie says, hey, look, the one place I'm I'm willing to pay ransoms is critical infrastructure for sure. Well. Doesn't that make critical infrastructure an even bigger critical infrastructure? Sorry, uh, an even bigger target uh, than it already was. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with both David and Ernie. So I'm going to kind of layer onto their sort of suggestions, but also kind of go yeah. farther, which is like, can we get to a point with with public sector, with government agencies, where like, because because the thing that we're not talking about with that ransomware is that it's a very rapid response that's required. Yeah. So you're making a very quick decision. And as a company, everything that you do as an officer is in the company's best interest. Mm -hmm. That's kind of the overarching theme. Like obviously the collateral effect is important, but if it is, but if it's if it is if it's contraindicated by something legal, then that takes it off the table. I I kind of query whether we could get through this, like, you know, the Biden orders and the sense of collaboration to a point where companies feel like they can turn to law enforcement during a ransomware attack to yeah. say, this is happening. We're going to do this. We're letting you know, and and maybe get some 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 sense of assistance, even to try to get to that level of attribution. Yeah. Right. Like maybe yeah. that's where this all goes. Maybe you split it in the middle and try to get there, and that's kind of the best case for right now because it is a very yeah. complicated issue. I think companies are in a really bad situation, especially as Ernie said, when there's PII on the line. The government is not willing to indemnify you, right, from all those yeah. suits that are coming. So, so you've got to still make the best decision for your company. That's a it's right. a very multi layered question. Right. Well, it looks to me like that's a great note to end on. Thank you so much to Ernie, 
David, Jen, thank you for being here. Thank you for contributing to this conversation. Um, and thanks to Bryson Bort and ICS Village for hosting us at this DEF CON panel talking about ransomware, critical infrastructure, and, and the potential impacts. Uh, have a great afternoon, everybody. Thanks a lot.